one minute. Okay, um, so welcome to the top colloquium today. And uh, we're very happy to have Mike um, Narik uh, speaking today. So Mike received his PhD um, about 10 years ago from Technische Universität Eindhoven. And now he's a principal researcher at the Microsoft Research at the Redmond. Um, Michael researches in security and uh, cryptography, and he's going to talk about finding twin smooth integers. Welcome. Thank you, Jing. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to speak in the TAT Colloquium, and uh, it's so good to see so many familiar faces. I somehow almost feel at home at Waterloo, although I've never been there. Um, but I work on a daily basis with people who graduated from there. So Patrick Longa and Greg Savruch are in, are in my group uh, and many more. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me start. I would like to talk about uh, finding twin smooth integers. Um, for those of you who have noticed, I dropped uh, for isogeny based cryptography from the title. Uh, and in fact, this will only come up at the very end of the talk. So there's no cryptography uh, until the very end here. So I've put a few numbers here on the screen for you. There's a whole list of consecutive numbers. Uh, two of them are highlighted. And you might uh, wonder what makes them special. The clue is in the title. So if you look at the uh, factorizations of all these numbers, you can see that those two are two consecutive numbers that have unusually small prime factors. So both of those numbers have, all, all their prime factors are at most 47. And let me show you two other numbers. So both these numbers are larger than two to the 249. consecutive numbers only have prime factors uh, less than two to the 15. All right, so let's start uh, here by making a bit more precise what we mean by small. So probably everybody knows the definition of a B smooth integer. So we are given, given a bound B, which is just a positive number. And we say that an integer M is B smooth if all its prime divisors are at most B. So here's a tiny example of, a five, of two five smooth numbers. Um, this, that's not very interesting um, because the, the larger the, the bound B is compared to the number, the less interesting becomes this property, right? So if, if B is actually the same size as M, then M is automatically B smooth, right? Um, and the smaller B gets, the more interesting this becomes. One extreme case would be two smooth numbers, which are essentially the powers of two, right? And they are very rare. So you can uh, take this B, you know, as a, for, for our regulating sort of how many of such numbers there are. And then uh, we are gonna talk about twin smooth integers. And there's nothing fancy here. These are just two consecutive B smooth integers, right? And those numbers 15 and 16 were an example of such a thing. And then there's two more here, 24 and 25, and 80 and 81. So now there's, here's the first interesting thing. These are all twin five smooth integers. So in fact, there's actually uh, just a, a, a finite number of twin smooth, five smooth integers, right? So for, for every fixed bound B, um, there's only a finite number of such twin smooth integers. So later we will add another con condition here at the very end. We will also be interested in such twin smooth in integers such that their sum is a prime number. So here I've listed 
the sums of m and m plus one, and the the orange numbers are primes, which is easy to satisfy in, in the small in this small range here, right? So this is not representative of what actually happens, but in the end we will be adding a condition uh, once we found such twin smooth integers. All right. So to recap, actually it's very easy to write down a five smooth integer of any size. Yeah, just take an arbitrary product of uh, those small primes up to five, two, three, and five, and then you get one. But if you look around it, usually you won't find the twin smooth uh, integers. In this case, there aren't even ones of that size, right? Um, I'm just waiting for my slides to advance because somehow PowerPoint has a problem with these uh, numbers here. It takes a few seconds to, <laughs> to load them. Right. Now nothing is happening. Maybe Zoom together with PowerPoint are exhausting the whole processing power here. Ah, there you go. All right. But now if we want to come up with a twin smooth pair of that size, we will have to increase the smoothness bound, right? So here is a comparable size twin smooth pair. And here we had to increase the bound to 19. All right. So what's the problem we're looking at here? So we're given a smoothness bound and we're given a size n. And now our task is to find an integer m, say that lies between n over 2 and n. So if we're thinking about n being powers of 2 here, we're looking for a number of a certain bit size such that m and m plus 1 are twin b smooth. We could also ask to find all such integers in an interval. Given that we're looking for cryptographic sizes, that means uh, like the second example I showed you in the very beginning, it, that might be too much to ask, depending on the bound B and the size of numbers. But what we're definitely going to do is we will have to find enough such integers. Yeah? If we later add another condition there, for example, that the sum of the two numbers is prime, we will have to find enough of those such that we have a chance that this can be satisfied. All right, so let's take a look at how we would possibly identify smooth integers other than just multiplying them together, right? So if, we, if we're given a random integer of some size, uh, what do we do to decide whether this number is B smooth? Well, one thing we could do is uh, compute the prime factorization of this number and just check for the size of the prime divisors. Um, we don't even have to do the, have to compute the whole factorization necessarily, right? So if the number is not smooth, we will notice that earlier. We can do a trial division with all the primes that are smaller than b and see once we've exhausted that, that the number is not gone. Yeah? If we, we've divided out all the numbers, all the primes less than b to enough uh, as until it doesn't work anymore, then um, we can easily say um, that the number is not B smooth. So trial division is actually a good algorithm. Uh, if B is small enough, yeah, that's how factoring algorithms work. You, if you get a random number, you will first do a bit of trial division with small integer, uh, with, with small primes. So in this case, that's actually a perfectly fine algorithm here. But then when you're given a whole interval, right? Uh, you know, you want to cover a certain search space um, and identify all the smooth numbers in such an interval, there's actually better algorithms to do that. And um, yeah, today we're going to look at one of those uh, and that's based on a sieve. And first, we're going to take a look at this ancient sieve of Eratosthenes. So the other day I was preparing these slides and my uh, son who's in fifth grade walked by and, and he said, oh, oh, I know this. We did that in third grade. So uh, this is third grade math here. Um, 
for fifth graders, that's probably worse even than knowing that this is more than 2000 years old. But let's take a look at how this works. You all probably know this. So how does this work? So this sieve identifies all the prime numbers up to a certain number. Here it's 50. Uh, and the first step is to cross out the number one, which is certainly not a prime. And then there's iterations of this algorithm. Uh, the thing you do is you go to the next open number, mark it as prime. And now you go in steps of that P. So here it's two and you cross out all the multiples, right? So we're gonna erase all the even numbers, uh, mark them as non-prime. Now, once we're done with this, we go to the next open number, mark it as prime. And now we go in steps of three. Here the six already was crossed out. Next is the nine. And that already tells you we could now go in steps of two P, right? Because we've already crossed out all the even multiples and so on and so forth. And then we go to the next open number. Now we have to skip four, right? Because four is already crossed out. Next open number is five and so on and so forth, seven. And now we're actually done once we've crossed out all the multiples of seven because we only have to do this up to the square root of the largest number we're looking at here because any composite will have a prime divisor that's less than its square root. So all these have been crossed out already. So we can now go through and mark all the remaining numbers. All right. So now we're gonna modify this slightly to uh, identify smooth numbers. You can already guess, right? So that we can now attribute divisibility here. So we're gonna start over. Now our goal is to find smooth numbers in this interval. First, of course, we need to say what we mean by smooth. So let's take B equals five. And so now we can mark the first five trivial five smooth numbers. And we're also gonna take note of the prime numbers less than or equal to five, right? So we need some more information than before. We can't just go through and cross things out. So we need to store some more here. So we're putting a list of integers that are initialized to one, right? let's call them accumulators. And we can now use this space to try to reconstruct the number in the place uh, by you know, multiplying with small prime divisors here. So we're, we're now going through the sieve and at the same time, uh, try to build up the number that's in that place with the primes less than or equal to five. So again, start with two, go in steps of two, and everywhere we land, we multiply the one by the prime two. Yeah? Four, six, eight, 10, and so on. I've marked all of them now and multiplied all the ones with the two. And here's the first difference to the uh, prime sieve. Um, we now also need to consider higher powers of our primes. So we also go to the next power of two, which is the four, because we do want to recognize powers of two, for example, right? So um, if we stop here, we won't see that there's a power of two that, that we are able to reconstruct that number in that place. So we need to take all these powers as well. So now we go in steps of four uh, and multiply the accumulator value by another two. Yeah. And then we go to eight and to 16. And now that's clear how that works. And we need to actually go up to the highest power that is less than 50. And in that case here, it's 32. And now you can see at 32, we've already reconstructed the 32 in the accumulator. So we know that one is uh, five smooth already. Okay, same algorithm with the three. Now notice every third position here is multiplied by three. The next power of three is nine. Every ninth position is multiplied by another three and 27. And now let's find, finish up with the powers of five. 25 here. And now we're done. Now we've 
gone through all the primes that are in our small prime factor base. And we've checked all their occurrences up to the numbers, up to the number 15. Yeah, so now we go through where is the accumulator equal to the index. And those are the smooth numbers that we were able to reconstruct with those small primes, right? So now we've, we can forget all the additional information. We can just, essentially, we can store a bit string, right? We can just say, okay, let's make this long string of bits. And a one here in position k tells you that the kth number is five smooth. Yeah. All right, so we did that for the interval from one up to 50, but we don't have to start at one. We can go anywhere and do an inter interval. Um, there are slight differences here. The first is we have to um, figure out where is the first number that's divisible by our prime we're currently sieving with. Okay, put the accumulators back and now we check, okay, 52 is the first even number. So we go through, multiply all those. Now, two to the two, four, happens to fall in the same place here. So that's a very easy change to make to the algorithm, right? You just do one division in the beginning, check where the next multiple is, the first multiple is, and then you do the same algorithm here. Okay, 16, 32, and here's another difference. Now we have to go up to 64 because now our end point of the interval is much higher. So we have to cover more um, powers. So that shows you that that is less efficient. So the further out we go, it becomes more work in the algorithm. And yeah, moving on to prime three, powers of three, 27. Here's the same. We have to go one power higher, go to 81. And then five looks pretty much the same as before. All right. Now we go through again, check which accumulator got to the number. Those are the smooth ones. Put them in a bit string. Now we have 100 bits telling us where the five smooth numbers are. And now we could go in here and check for twin smooths, right? Two, con two uh, neighboring ones, Let's mark them in blue here. And there you can see the examples we had before, 15, 16, 24, 25, and 80, 81. Okay, so one more thing. This is all pretty simple. You might have seen this several times before. There's some optimizations here I want to quickly touch upon. So the first one is that instead of working with primes here, we would we work with the rounded logarithms of the primes, right? So we take log two. Uh, so here log means space two logarithm, log three, log five, we round those numbers and we can call it log sieving. And those numbers are one, two, and two. And now our accumulators we, we replace by zeros. So what do we do? We just, we just transform everything from multiplications into addition. So we go from the multiplicative setting to the additive one. Um, instead of multiplying numbers together, we will be adding logarithms. And we will be trying to reconstruct the logarithm of the number in this accumulator. Why are we doing this? Well, now we have only have to add numbers instead of multiply. That is usually a lot cheaper. Um, and the numbers are smaller. Logarithms are way smaller than the actual numbers. So adding way smaller numbers here instead of multiplying. And also that needs a lot less space for the accumulator um, array here. Right. And then the algorithm works as before. Now notice we, we're adding one here in the multiples of two. I'm going through this quickly now because you've seen it quite a few times, just showing that we're now adding logarithms instead of multiplying the primes. And the powers of three. And again, the powers, powers of five. Notice here now we're adding two. Um, all right. And now the top numbers here, 
which are mostly six and then some sevens down there. These are the rounded logarithms of the, the numbers in our interval. And you can see we have rounded the two, three, and five up here, right? So the one, well, the two, the logarithm of two is exactly one. For three, we've rounded up. And for five, we've rounded down to the two. So this overall is not a precise algorithm anymore, right? So this has some error and you can see it now if we compare also then in addition, we round the, the logarithm of the numbers themselves. And now when you compare, you can see that some are off here, right? So the 54, the accumulator is larger by one than the actual rounded logarithm. So we get some errors here. That means we have to change our condition. We cannot just compare equality. We have to allow some error slightly less and slightly larger than the actual logarithm because of the rounding. This also means um, in the end, we might miss a smooth number or we might get some uh, marked as smooth that are not uh, smooth actually. But that's not a big problem. We can always check later. Right, just the advantage of doing it that way in terms of speed is uh, way higher. And you can see the 100 here, the number is actually lower uh, than the seven. So if you're looking at powers of two, uh, powers of three, for example, since we round it up, um, that number will always be higher, like the 81 here, right? Okay, but this is enough in terms of sieving. So you can now think of that being the basis uh, of our algorithm. So we have this log sieve, which we can use, and that produces a bit string of uh, the locations of the smooth numbers. A brief look at complexity. Um, so what is actually the cost of doing this? So if we start down here, so remember what we did for every prime, we had to do length of the interval divided by P steps in the, in the sieve, right? So each step is actually just an addition of P to the running index. So these are L over P additions of P. And then every time we hit a number, we add the logarithm of P. So that's another, another addition of P. So this is per prime, L over P steps, and then you sum over all the primes less than B, and you might know this formula. Um, this is roughly log log B, where now that's the natural logarithm. So we, we roughly get this runtime. It's L length of the interval times log log B. So per number, this is just log log B operation. Well, well additions here, right? Small integer additions. Um, if you compare that to trial division, what does it cost to do trial division? Um, well, one worst case would be you have a power of two, you would be doing a log uh, number, log of the number divisions by two, or the other worst case sort of is you have to try all the, all the primes, which is like B over log B um, divisions for all those primes. And then clearly this is a lot better if we can amortize over a large interval. Okay, so now we get this. So what could we do now? We could go ahead and just take our target interval, a certain size of numbers, run this sieve and hope to find two neighboring ones that give us a twin smooth pair. But yeah, it might be worth to look a little bit at what are our chances to finding those. So this is the uh, counting function for uh, smooth integers. So it's a function psi of x and y, which counts the numbers between one and x that are y smooth. So it turns out there's uh, an old theorem by Dickman, which states that if you have y in the form x to the one over u, for a fixed value of u, then this can actually be approximated by x times a function rho of u. And this function is called the Dickman-De Bruyne function. 
This approximation holds for x uh, goes to infinity and for a fixed u, and there are certain restrictions on the um, range of the smoothness bound here, but for simplicity, we're going to assume we're in that range, and this is a good enough approximation. Um, for our purposes, it turned out it was, um, but one has to be careful here um, where one applies this approximation. So for our purposes, we're going to just use this ratio so we can divide through by x, right? And we're going to use this, which is just the value of the row function as like a gauge for the probability um, to find such a smooth uh, integer. If we just randomly pick one from, the, from that interval between one and, and x or um, n here, right? So if we translate that back into terms of n and b, so we'll set x is n and x to the one over u is b. And then it turns out that u is just the log of n divided by the log of b. So that's an easy way to just get a rough estimate of the ratio of uh, smooth integers in the, in the overall uh, range here. Um, so we're making an assumption here, right? That, that smooth numbers are uh, uniformly distributed, which is most certainly not true but it turns out to be useful. It's actually, it, it gives a good feeling for what's going on. All right, so then plugging in our n and b, we just evaluate rho at log n over log b. And let's take a look here for sort of the smallest cryptographically relevant parameters that we would like to find. Um, we're looking for numbers that are around 250, 250 up to 256 bits, right? And let's say we're looking for two to the 15 smooth uh, integers. Since I showed you some of those in the beginning, that might be a useful thing to do. And plugging that into the row function, 256 over 15 gives a value that's less than two to the minus 76. So even if we're off here by a few orders of magnitude, that still looks uh, very um, hopeless, right? Let's pick just two positions anywhere to what is the chance that we will get twin smooths out of that even even just running two to the 76 uh, checking two to the 76 numbers to find a smooth one is hopeless so what about we look for way smaller numbers that are two to the 15 smooth yeah intuitively very clear that this should be better and indeed it is right so the rough estimate for the probability here is way, way higher. So now we, if we, if we go to, a, to numbers that are less than two to the 43, um, they just come up very frequently. Um, yeah? So the probability here is roughly two to the minus three, uh, two to the minus four. And so we could now find many different smaller ones, right? So here's an idea. <laughs> Very smart. We take six small uh, numbers that are two to the 15 smooth and multiply them together, right? So we get something that's about the size we're looking for. That's because if you multiply smooth numbers, the, the, the result is still smooth. Um, so you might ask, okay, why in the first place not write down smooth numbers uh, by multiplying all those primes together? That's right. That's what we would do if we were only looking for single ones. But for the, remember, our goal is to find twin smooth integers. Okay. So, but there's a problem here, right? So we would, for twin smooth, we need two such products. How can we ensure that they differ by one only, right? So we want to write down two of those that lie right next to each other. All right, so that's the goal for the rest of the talk. <laughs> um, so yeah, take what we have here. We have our algorithm that can uh, take any interval somewhere and just save there and produce a bit string that marks the smooth numbers for our given bound. And now we need to do something on top of that to come up with such products here. Uh, any questions? 
Uh, something I forgot to say in the beginning, please feel free to ask questions. I can see the chat right now, but if someone would just check that, if questions come up there, please let me know. Okay, so here's a cut. And now this is where the proletary ASCO problem comes in, right? So let's forget about all the smoothness for a moment and just look at this problem. So the problem is parametrized by two integers, a size k, a size n, sorry, and a degree k. And now the, the problem asks us to find two multisets of integers, a, which consists of little a i, uh, where several of those could be equal. Um, we still count them separately. And then there's a multiset b of little uh, b i, uh, those sets should be different. Uh, and then they, those numbers need to satisfy those power sum equations. So um, the sum of all the AI uh, has to be equal to the sum of all the BI. And then the sum of all the squares of the AI has, has to be equal to the sum of squares of all the BI up to the kth power that's given by the degree parameter. Okay, so we can write this, uh, just, just rewrite it as a formal sum here, nothing happened. And then solutions to this, we write with these uh, brackets down there and we put the K, um, the degree K at the equal sign. Um, and you might wonder whether those exist at all, right? Integer values that satisfy all these equations. Um, so here's an example, here's it written out for uh, size six and degree five. And here is a solution. So uh, if anyone wants to quickly check that, um, I'll, I can wait. Here's uh, some hint. So these are the sums. You can see in the first line, I mean, you know, satisfying the sum is sort of not the problem, right? So here's it adding 22 to 22, take the five and the 17, 22 here, and then here you group them the same way. Yeah, it turns out there's, there are solutions to this problem. Uh, so they do have to be distinct, the integers? No. No, so you can, so you always have trivial solutions then, right, so? Uh, well, no, the, the sets have to be different, right? Um, okay. So I, I was thinking, yeah, you could think of, you know, take all zeros and one. So all zeros doesn't work because the sets have to be different. All zeros and one that also doesn't work because you can, you know, construct the one in a different way on the other side, right? So um, here's, a, here's a solution with repeating roots, right? So that can happen. So they don't have to all be different but there's actually no more restrictions other than the multi-set, multi-sets have to be different. And uh, for those of you who wanna check, yeah, numbers. Okay, so there are solutions. So we're not talking about uh, the empty set here. All right, so let's slightly move uh, back to what, we're, what our goal is here. So there's an equivalent formulation of this problem. Um, which is given here. So that sum that, that um, the first representation of the problem with given these power sums is actually equivalent to the condition below. So we're looking at a difference of two polynomials here. So we're just taking all the AI as roots and we're just multiplying together X minus AI for all the AI and also multiply together all the x minus bi on the other side. And then uh, we subtract them, then clearly the x to the n term cancels. So this thing can have at most degree n minus one. And now the problem is equivalent to stating that this polynomial has degree less than or equal to n minus one minus k. In other words, for every equation of these power sums, um, we're reducing the degree of this polynomial by one. And if you have a closer look at this, it's actually pretty simple to see. Let's take a look at this example for size three. Here are the 
two polynomials uh, and their difference. And just multiplying that out, you can see that, well, of course, the x cubed term cancels out. And then the x squared term is just the difference of the sums of the ai and bi. And the x term is has all the mixed products, right? The a1, a2, a1, a3, a2, a3. And this can be written rewritten as the square of the uh, sums minus the square of uh, minus the sum of the squares, right? And then we have to divide by two. Um, so that's a that's how the x term can be rewritten. And now you see if the if it's uh, a one solution, so the, 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 the sum of the uh, AIs and BIs, they are equal, then clearly this X squared term cancels out. So it reduces the degree by one. And if in addition, the square sums also are equal, then this will also cancel the second term at the X and it will reduce the uh, degree by one more. And in general, this, uh, these are just the Newton identities between power sums and uh, elementary symmetric polynomials. You can just use these recursions and you can easily see that this works in general. All right. So now in this case, uh, if all those cancel, we're left with a constant here. Okay. And now we're interested in not any arbitrary solutions, we're interested in so-called ideal solutions to this problem. And those are the ones where k is n minus one. Yeah, so k is as large as it can get. And for those, that's what we're interested at. And the, the first intuition that this is a difficult problem to solve is actually right. There are only solutions known currently for these, degree, uh, for, for these sizes down there. Uh, everything between 2 and 10. There are no solutions for size 11 and there are, I think, one or two for size 12. And that's it. Um, actually, there's a, a PhD thesis from 2012 from the University of Waterloo by Timothy Cayley, who has worked on this problem. And it's, that's a nice uh, summary at the time of the state of this and he generalizes it to Gaussian integers and things like that. All right, so we're interested in ideal solutions. Why is that? Because looking at the equivalent uh, representation of the problem, that means that the degree is reduced all the way down to zero. Yeah? Remember the degree was less than or equal n minus one minus k, and if k is n minus one, the degree of this difference is zero, which means down here, that one polynomial is equal to the other one plus a constant. And this is something we really uh, like. Let's look at the examples. So here's the first example, um, writing down the polynomials, just you know, taking the AI as roots and the BI. And then it turns out since here is a zero, the constant term of the first one is zero. So we just multiply out all the, um, roots down here. This is 100,800, so that's the constant. And here's the second example. Here the constant is even smaller, it's 14,400. And these constants are all um, very smooth. Yeah? The 14,400 is 2 to the 6, 3 squared, 5 squared. And the 100,800 is uh, 2 to the 6, 3 squared, 5 squared times 7. Um, there's a whole uh, theory behind these constants. So you can define a fundamental constant that is the GCD of all the constants of all the solutions for a specific fixed size n um, for all the ideal solutions. And yeah, there's a lot of results about those um, bounds to determine them. What we can say is that n minus one factorial always divides it, um, but that's not sort of irrelevant for what we're doing here. Okay, there are some other interesting things uh, about these PTE solutions. Um, if you write them down a different kind of way here, uh, just uh, 
that way you can see nice patterns come up. Second one here. So you can see there's always two of on one side and two on the other. If you sort them, you start by zero. Um, actually, you can, if you look at the polynomial, you can actually shift those polynomials by a constant. And then the, the, the constant, that's the difference of the two polynomials will stay the same. Right, so you can have you can construct other solutions by shifting them, but those you can we we can safely uh, you know consider equivalent. So we can actually normalize all these solutions to start at zero. So we move one solution to zero and order them uh, so we only have positive ones. And then here you can see this nice pattern, and this is called the interlacing theorem. Very simple to explain. If you think about these uh, polynomials. Actually, one of them is the shift of the other, right? So the shape of those, if you look at that as a function, um, one is just a version of the other shifted upwards. And then you can see what happens with the roots here, right? So those two move inwards, the green ones move to the orange. So that's exactly the pattern here. So you have one from the one side, two from the other side, two from the one side, and so on. Very simple proof. Um, and also, as I said, we could shift them symmetrically around zero. And then you can see that these solutions are symmetric in the sense that you can negate all the integers here. You get the same set and the same on that side. So for an even uh, PTE size, this is, a no this is the notion of symmetric solutions. And it turns out if you're looking for it, it, those seem to be easier to find because they are more restrictive, right? They restrict the, the search space. Um, so many of the solutions out there are symmetric and there are parameterized solutions that are mostly symmetric as well. Okay, so now we get back to our problem finding twin smooth integers. Okay, here's that one example. And of course, we just divide by the constant, right? Then we have two polynomials that differ by one. So now this is a parameterization, possibly for integers, right? So if we find an X, an integer X, such that this denominator is somehow canceled in those other terms, we find two integers that are one apart. And since these constants are smooth, they have very small divisors, there are good chances that those numbers, you know, contain them and cancel them out. So adding the smoothness condition here, what do we do? Remember, we were looking for two products that differ by one, here they are, <clears throat> they are just parameterized by polynomials. And now we just look for a value x, such that all nine terms, x, x minus one, minus three, and so forth, are B smooth. Then multiplying them all in that form as given by the polynomials will result hopefully in smooth integers once the denominator cancels that are differ, that, that differ by one. And here is where we get back to our sieve. So we can now um, sieve through the numbers in the range up to two to the 43, remember? Uh, I was claiming we could do products of six. These are exactly the products of six right here. Up there, there are six different terms. Down here, there are squares. And by the way, the interlacing theorem tells us that you can't hope for higher powers. So two is all you can do here, right? So you can only do, uh, you, we cannot have three um, consecutive or equal roots on one side when we work with these PT solutions. So now we take our sieve and we look for this pattern, right? So here's the X, X minus one, minus three. So we identify this pattern and this is what we're searching for. So this is way more difficult than just uh, twin smooth numbers, but the range, the numbers are so much smaller that we have a higher chance of finding this than directly looking for twin smooth integers in the large range. 
right? So if we make all sorts of assumptions here that they are independent and uniformly distributed, we would come out with a probability of two to the minus 35 to find such a pattern uh, among the two to the 43 numbers here. Yeah, this is probably off uh, because of all these assumptions that will not hold. But even if we're a few orders of magnitude off, this is something we can do, all right? So that's what we did. We implemented all this, the whole, the, the sieve and some way of dealing with these solutions. So we took PTE solutions from the literature. We generated more of them. There are ways you can use elliptic curves. So those correspond to points on elliptic curves. You can uh, add them and generate new solutions here. So for some that works well, for others it doesn't. And we generated a whole bunch of solutions. And then um, we ran our sieve. So we, the sieve takes a certain interval, produces that bit string, and then it searches for these patterns that come from the solutions. And we actually uh, in, include many different um, solutions. So we, we just sieve an interval once, and then we check for a, a few hundred of those at the same time. Uh, and we do that with a sort of tree-based approach where we minimize uh, as much as possible the checks we need to know we need to do right so the default case here is that we don't find that pattern so we need to exclude as many solutions as possible quickly uh, to not waste too much time checking things that are not necessary and then we cover the interval from 2 to the 40 to 2 to the 45 i write plus epsilon and we went a bit higher we have one example that's a bit larger than that. And we found many twin two to the 16 smooth integers. Um, and even many where the, their, their sum is prime. Yeah, so we cover all these bit sizes for P. There are a few missing here, two to the 54, two to the 51. Um, but all, mostly that, that whole range we, we can cover with parameters. Um, and uh, we included a C, so the whole the implementation is in Python, but the, the core that does the sieving is actually very fast C code. And Patrick Longa helped us with that a little bit. Um, that made it a factor 100 faster on certain instances. Okay, here's an example. That's actually the one I gave you in the very beginning. Down there, you can see the prime. Here's the X value that produced this pattern. Um, it's a different solution than the one, but it's also one with squares on one side. Um, the prime has 250 bits and it's actually better than two to the 16, it's two to the 15 smooth. And then we also, so this would, getting slowly into the cryptography here, this would correspond to what we now call NIST level one, so something that is supposed to be as uh, secure as breaking AES-128, be it classically or on a quantum computer. And then this is level three. So we're looking at around 384 bits. This is a bit smaller. So we were able to go there. Um, so this number is 376 bits. Uh, here's the prime down there and the factorization of p plus one and p minus one. And just to conclude here briefly, why did we do that? <laughs> why did we come across this problem? Well, uh, the, these primes can be used as parameters for, for example, for the uh, isogeny-based key exchange B-side that Craig Costello came up with in 2019. This is a similar scheme to SIDH. Um, and sort of motivation could be that you can even reduce the, the key size um, further than, than for SIDH and psych. We know uh, among the post-quantum cryptography schemes, uh, SIDH and psych are pretty good. They have pretty small keys and they offer a compressed version. Um, but B-side, even uncompressed, has the potential to be even smaller than compressed SIDH and compressed psych. And what's the different in, difference in terms of uh, parameters? Well, both of those schemes, SIDH and B-side, use super singular elliptic curves. Um, I've written one down here in Montgomery form, which is the form we 
often use um, over defined over f p squared. And that's the p we were looking for, the prime p that will be used to define those elliptic curves, points on them, and then isogenies between such curves. Um, so for SIDH, um, we can we, we need a prime p where, for example, p plus 1 is smooth, right? So that's what's usually done. We take 2 to the e, 3 to the f minus 1. And that's an example of simply writing down a smooth number, right? That's the best you can do because we need two uh, factors here that are co-prime and that are as smooth as possible. But now for B side, it works slightly differently and it requires that P plus one and P minus one are smooth, are as smooth as possible because the efficiency of the scheme uh, relies on that property, right? The smaller B is, the smaller the prime factors in here the uh, faster the isogeny computations, the faster the scheme. That's the motivation for looking for those primes. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Michael, for the nice talk. Um, so any questions for Michael? Thanks, Michael. Um, so on this slide here, you said the smaller the B, the more efficient B side is. Is there any trade-off in security? Like does B side become easier to break for smoother primes or it's independent of that? Well, as ontologically speaking, we're, we don't know of any advantage here, right? So it all depends on the size of the subgroups. So basically the size of you know that the corresponding pieces that correspond to the two to the e and three to the f in SIDH, you will have those in p plus one and p minus one. So those get split up in p plus one and p minus one, and they look different. They have many different primes now because they are divisors of p plus one and p minus one. And yeah, all these algorithms. So if you look at the von Orschut Wiener algorithm, that just depends on the size of those, right? Then there are other algorithms to break it where it depends on the size of p. For example, the delft galbraith algorithm to compute isogenies just depends on the size of P. And this is a square root algorithm. So that's the reason we're looking at parameters that somehow look like elliptic curve ones from their sizes, right? What it does do is if you have smaller B, it also speeds up the isogeny computation for the attacker, right? So you get a constant improvement, but yeah, it doesn't seem to help with general algorithmic improvement. Thanks. Okay, other questions? Uh, yeah, I've got one. Um, really enjoyed the talk, Michael. Um, so you said uh, you have this like 2 to the 15 smooth 250-bit uh, number. How mm -hmm. much smaller could you possibly go with the smoothness bound? For a 250-bit number, I mean, can you go to 2 to the 14, it, putting aside the computational difficulties? So with that, so remember, we covered that whole interval between 2 to the 40 and 2 to the 45. So this sort of, and we didn't find anything better in there, right? So that means, well, there are certain, it doesn't mean there are none out there. It just means that with this method, and with the set of solutions we were using, um, there are just no better ones, right? So we need to, so what we could do is extend, try to extend the solutions. There's a lot of things we can play with here. I only showed you the degree six, well, the, the size six solutions that lead to degree six polynomials. You can do, we've also tried like degree four and eight. So for the higher security levels, we. We're still running experiments. It's, it's sort of unclear. And, but but for, the, for this example with size 6 and to the 15, that seems to be exactly the, um, the, the sweet spot there. <laughs> you can also see it that the larger the numbers go, you could see that we, we were missing the 254 and the 251. They get more rare. So around that um, size with our methods, um, yeah would be difficult to find better ones. But I mean, there's a lot of things you can change here, right? You can, you can even go away from the 
um, PTE solutions again. So Craig in his original paper used the polynomial uh, where P is two to the two times X to the four minus one. So P plus one is X to the four, two, two times X to the four minus uh, X to the four and P minus one is two times X to the four minus one. So those split except for the X squared plus one factor. And this one has produced a very nice one where one side is two to the 13 smooth, right? So yeah, we're hoping to, you know, find slight modifications, some other twist that allows us to find better ones here. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, well, one question. So is the existence of, of a large um, these moose twin clear? Like, do they always exist if you want to find such twin bigger than a specified number n or something? Is it obvious? No. I don't know if it's obvious. It seems, right? If you just increase the b, then you should be able to find some. I mean, if you. Oh, no, sorry. What, what I mean is, um, given b, mm -hmm. um, um, is it clear that for every n, and you there exists a b smooth twin that are bigger than n? Well, it's clear that they don't exist, right? So because they are only finitely many, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so that could happen, right? If we run something here and our b is too small, there's just nothing we could find because okay. uh, you know there we already ran out of them way before. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So that's that's something to be taken into account. Um, yeah, you might run an experiment that's bound to find nothing. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay, um, then let's thank Michael for the nice talk again. And now we go to the virtual Red House. <laughs>